So let's go into the basics of the Deferred Sales Trust and what is it? Yeah, Deferred Sales Trust is a manufactured installment sale. And that's a big word for saying the ability to carry back paper and it, and it allows you to defer tax. So the IRS has these different tax codes, stuff like, you know, IRS, you know, 401k or IRS 1031. Uh, they have a thing called, uh, it's, you know, IRS C is actually a better way to put it, uh, 453. And this 453 part of the tax code is known as a seller carryback. And that's the foundation of the deferred sales trust. So let's imagine, you know, Joe, you had a $10 million primary home in Silicon Valley. Let's imagine you bought it for a million bucks, you know, 30 years ago, and now you're about to sell. Well, if you sell that, you're going to be hit with a big, big tax. But guess what? If you sell it on an installment, meaning you carry back paper, you became the lender guess what that tax is deferred until you receive payment and that's exactly what we do the difference is we throw in the trust we find a buyer who's who's got the full 10 million and this trust becomes the third party that ends up with the cash and Joe ends up with the promissory note and therefore he's in a tax deferral state the nice part about this is it's been tried and true for over 25 years, thousands of closes, billions under management, and it's been tested by the IRS about a dozen times. And so you can rest rest knowing that it's uh, it's something that's legal. It works every time. It's never failed. And by the way, it works for cryptocurrency, right? And it works for it works for businesses. And in fact, well, um, we're working on a big deal, which we can talk about here in a minute. But we just closed one in, in, in Palo Alto, an $8.3 million primary home sale. And he felt really challenged because he bought it pretty low and all of a sudden he's hit with a big tax. And if it wasn't for the Deferred Sales Trust, he wouldn't be able to sell it. We just did another one in Menlo Park. We just did another one um, in, in Colorado Springs. And so the key is just knowing what your tax is, right? What's your liability? And then how can you defer it? And the same thing is true for the 1031 exchange. These are all different codes of the IRS tax code that give you, if you follow the rules, the ability to create and preserve more wealth as you follow the rules and defer the tax. So for those that are listening and they're sitting there thinking they may have some assets coming up where they could have some capital gain implications, you know, what are the qualifications to be able to utilize this DSA? Big question. So our minimum minimum is $1 million uh, of net proceeds and at least $1 million gain. And the reason we have those minimums is because the pain has to be big enough to pay for our services. And so to give you an example, in California, for example, I like to use 37 to 50% of the gain is going to be wiped out by depreciation recapture and capital gains tax. Now, depending on what state you're in and your income bracket, a lot of different things uh, kind of come and play there, but that's our minimum. We want to make sure that uh, folks understand that because if it's too small, our fees eat up the savings and we say, just pay the tax. Now, if you had like a couple deals, you know, that add up to that, you know, one or two, you know, 500, 500, then that's fine. So that's who this is for. Again, it works for business owners. It works for S corps, LLCs, C corps. It works for primary homes. It works for cryptocurrency. It works for artwork collectibles, right? Just about anything that's highly appreciated. So if you have that, a million dollar gain and at least a million dollar net proceeds over one or two assets at least, then we're a great fit for uh, for somebody. I hope that answers the question, Joe. Yeah. Whenever I hear of some tax strategies, why does it always seem to be brewing up out of California, huh? Like all the great tax people I seem to meet over the last year seem to be some type of headquarter in California. Why is that? Yeah, we're on the front lines, you know what I mean? And I grew up here and so I've seen it, you know, I've seen California change a lot in my 37 years here uh, in California, right? And, you know, the business environment, unfortunately, you know, the, the, our leadership has failed us, you know, and, and you're looking at leadership that it, they don't do a great job of managing um, wealth uh, or taxes or, or funds, right? And so, California is probably the worst. Maybe New York is right there with it. And and so we we just see the pain, right? And I guess when you see the pain enough and the challenge is enough, you want to solve that, right? And that's that's our passion is solving that challenge and giving people the chance to have a transformational exit plan and transformational ways of, of buying and selling assets. And 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 so yeah, that's probably my best answer for that, Joe. That's good. So with the fellow you're working with uh with the residents in California, can you kind of walk us through through that, uh, you know, for listeners that get understanding of how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we'll start with the real estate one. We just did, uh, for our gentleman, he sold a two, this is last week, it closed. It's a two and a half million dollar uh, multifamily property and he's owned it for over 30 years, okay? And so multifamily, if you've owned it for more than 27 and a half years and you've taken depreciation, it goes, your basis goes to zero. 
And so he met with me and this is about 45 days ago, um, his broker introduced uh, us and we sat down and I said, well, why are you selling? And his name is Ross. And he goes, well, I'm just tired of Gavin Newsom, the rent control. I'm tired of the tenants. I'm just, I'm old, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I want to be out. And I think it's a good time to sell. I said, well, Ross, I think you're right. I said, well, what do you want to do with the money? He said, well, I like to invest it into, you know, some liquid investments, you know, maybe it's just, just conservative stocks, bonds, mutual funds. I'd also like to invest it in some passive real estate where I don't have to deal with all that stuff. Can you do that? And I said, yeah, we can do that. And he said, well, I said, well, you have 2.5 million. What tax would you have? What, what's the tax liability? What's the check you were going to write? He goes, well, about a million dollars. Well, I said, well, Ross, would you like 1.5 million or would you like to use our service and have 2.5 million minus some fees? And he says, well, Brett, what's the interest I would pay on that million to the, to the, to the uh, IRS? And he goes, no, no interest. They charge you zero interest, Ross. And he said, well, that's, that's pretty good. And when do I have to pay back the, ta uh, the tax? I go, well, as you receive payments, you pay back tax and he goes, okay, well, do I have to dip into that, you know, 2.5 or can I just live off the interest? So you can live off the interest. You'll pay some tax on it. He goes, oh, well, sign me up. <laughs> we met for about an hour and a half and, and he did the deal, right? Because it was really, really simple. It was just math. He could defer the tax and all that extra million, he's going to receive interest payments over his lifetime and he can pass it to his kids. So that's how it works, right? We're basically taking, you know, what would have been a tax. We're going to defer it, move it into the trust, and then you're going to be able to invest and live off the interest, cash flow producing properties, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, a diversified type of portfolio. And for him, it was really nice because he had one asset that was 2.5 million that was sky high. So he's taking that one single asset and he's diversifying into multiple things. So that's the first deal. His name is Ross. Before we jump to the next one is on that one. So when he, when that capital gets parked in that trust, right? Mm -hmm. And he's getting those payments. Is that interest only? Is that part of the principal? When is that deferral of that uh, tax due? Great question. We can structure it however you would like. And some people might structure it with principal and interest. And as they dip into principal, they'll pay capital gains tax. As they live off the interest, they'll pay ordinary income tax. So most of our notes are structures, 10 year notes. These are promissory notes. So Ross has become the lender. He's lent the 2.5 million to the trust. Okay. And typically they're structured at 8% interest compounding over a 10 year period of time, not guaranteed, but that's the goal to go make that return net of the recurring fees. And as he pays, as he receives, let's say exactly eight, he'll pay and it earned eight. He just pay ordinary income tax. If he wanted to receive 12 and it earned, only earned eight on that 4%, it would dip into principal and he'd pay capital gains tax on that. So he would just pay a little bit of both depending on what he receives. Now, most of our clients like to structure something like this interest only payments over a 10 year period of time. I don't necessarily want or need to dip into the principal. Now, if I do, you always can and pay tax on that, but most will just keep it very simple. Some will even delay payments for a couple of years and say, you know what? I don't actually need any money right now. So like a 401k or an IRA, Joe, you can park funds there. And guess what? You're not taking that income now. When do you pay tax on that? Well, when you start receiving it. So we have another client who's selling out of Southern California for a property and they are moving to Georgia and, uh, and they don't plan to take any payments from the trust for a year or two until they establish new residency in Georgia. And then they'll start receiving payments and they'll pay ordinary income tax based upon Georgia. Uh, we closed, we actually closed a, a, another deal in Alabama for our client. And that was a $2.6 million sale. And for him, it was nice. He wanted to pivot from being a business owner to building apartment complexes. So it's kind of a different business, but he was faced about $600,000 of tax. So he sold, deferred the tax, and now he's building 70 units in Tennessee, but he's delaying all of the payments from the trust because his income, he's in his forties, his income is, is really high. He's like, Brett, do I need to take payments? He's like, you don't need to. He's like, can I delay it for four years? We're like, yeah. In the meantime, it's just compounding and building up like a 401k or an IRA. So there's a lot of ways to structure it, but I want to let you know, Joe, that it's adjustable, right? You might start out saying, I don't need any income right now, but then guess what? You lose your job next next year or or your income drops or you know your wife's going to stay at home. And you say, well, Brett, we want to replace that income. Can we turn that income on? Yeah, you can turn it on. And then you receive the income and then you go, well, can we turn it off? Maybe the next year she goes and gets a job now and her income is back out and then you can turn it off. So it's, you never set in cement, but you work with the advisor and with myself to make sure that it's, uh, it's coming out the way that you would like. So what, uh, at the end of the 10 year period, what happens? And is there ability, ability to renew that? 
Great question. Yeah, it's the ability to renew. Every 10 years, you can renew for 10 years and renew for 10 years, and then you can pass it to your kids inside of a living trust, and they can step into your shoes, and they can keep this going as well, tax deferred, until they receive payments. And so typically, I guess if you're deferring it out, by the time you have to pay that tax bill, you're paying with like inflated dollars in a sense, meaning you're compounding your money at a higher rate and then paying the tax bill previously due, correct? Yes, it all depends in when you receive it and what state of residency you receive it based upon your income that you receive it. So all of those things depend on, on your individual circumstance. But yes, as you think of it like uh, any investment right now, you get a 1099, by the way, it's actually an easier way to think about it. All you receive is whatever you received in that given year, a 1099 INT to report to your CPA, right? Based upon the interest that you received. Now, if you dipped into principal, you'd also report that to your CPA and you pay some capital gains tax on that. So it's actually very simple. Matt, all that reporting you guys provide for the clients. Exactly. So we do all the tax uh, prep for all of the trust. We just provide you a 1099 and you get you go to your personal CPA to do that um, on your side. So yeah, it's actually very seamless for you and we do all the back end stuff. Well, that's what everyone wants to hear. No one wants to do any work. <laughs> <laughs>